Today we're gonna unwrap some new feather, feather shverts from Kvetten. Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatoria, the fencing club, historical fencing club, and we use Feder, Feder Schwertz, a lot. Um, whilst I'm not a longsword specialist these days, I do teach regular longsword classes and I occasionally fence longswords still. So, uh, but we've got some very good longsworders in the club and Feders see a lot of use. And um, these are from Kvetten. Now, uh, as you, if you look at previous review videos, you'll see that I have the beginnings of a review between a Kvetten, a Siggy and a uh, Regnier Feder. Um, there will be continuing videos on that topic. I just haven't had the chances uh, to chance with the club to film properly, but they're going to be going through some rigorous testing in the club. But that being said, the models of uh, Feder are continually moving forward, and Kvetten are a perfect example of that. Now, full disclosure, I do work with Kvetten. As you know, I developed the um, the Eastern Mark III Sabre with Kvetten, which is currently available um, all over the world. It's their biggest selling product, in fact, and is one of the most widely used um, sabres, practice sabres, uh, in the world currently. And my work with Kvetten will be ongoing. There will be new products further down the line. Now, what I also want to say, and the reason I'm saying this, is these are not those. So I am going to be looking at these completely impartially. Um, these are not something I've been involved in the development with, but full disclosure, I do work with Kvetten. So I had a meeting the other day with um, Alex from uh, from Kvetten, who runs a company, and we uh, he told me about these feather because I don't I didn't know an awful lot about them. I was vaguely aware of the fact that Kvetten changed um, their kind of vision, I guess, for their products for the future. Um, I think, you know, in, in the last year or so, so that what they're now doing is they're now redoing their product lines to make essentially swords that are much closer to specific historical originals. And along those lines, therefore, there are three feather that uh, Alex was talking to me about. So first up, uh, and these are two of them, these aren't three of them, these are two of them. So one of those, is the what they've called the Lichtenau Feder, which is a feather which is essentially based on um, research. In fact, if I can get hold of it, there'll be an article link below here, so have a look in the links down below this video. Um, it's based on research and an article and is supposed to be based on the type of Federschwert that might have been used by Lichtenauer and the first generation people like um, von Danzig and um, Talhofer and Paulus Kahn, people like that, the kind of first and second generations of masters that came after Lichtenauer. So in other words, a 15th century, early, early to mid 15th, and I guess actually early to late 15th century uh, Federschwert. Okay, so that's the first one. And the other one, I'm, I think that's this one actually, what we'll see when we unwrap them. The second one is the so-called Maya inspired Federschwert. Now this is very interesting because this uses extremely high tech. Uh, so this is uh, based on, uh, so Joachim Maya wrote a treatise in 1570. It's very famous. You see its images used a lot online. Um, and in fact, I was accidentally aware of Maya before I ever knew that Hema was a thing because I had an Arms and Armour book when I was a teenager that I pored over because I was obsessed with Arms and Armour and it had pictures from Maya in it. Um, they were, it was a widely printed book in 1570 and therefore lots of people ended up with the pictures and they got used in Arms and Armour books without me realising it was from a fencing treatise because I didn't know fencing treatises were a thing at the time. Anyway, um, in 1570, the longsword was still being used, but it was mainly being wasn't being used on the battlefields an awful lot anymore. It was still occasionally, uh, but by 1570, the longsword was almost an archaic fencing form that survived in some places, like in Belgium, until the 18th century. In fact, I think even early 19th century. Um, but it was still used in the fencing schools. And what we see in Joachim Meyer's treaties is essentially a later form of longsword fencing. So there are some differences to the rules and the conventions that were used by Mayer's time. Although, I should mention a lot of people use Mayer's treaties from 1570 as, should we say, frog DNA, because it's very well described, it's a very well codified system by that point, to explain and fill some gaps in the earlier 15th century material, which is sometimes harder to interpret. So, I'm not going to get into an argument over whether Maya is the same as Lichtenau, or whether it's evolved or devolved or changed or whatever. 
I don't really study the German longsword and I'm quite hands up and open about that. But this is a longsword that is very high tech. These are the headlines, very high tech, and I'll come back to that in a second, and based on Mayer's treatise of 1570. So there will be a difference in shape and form between the so-called uh, Lichti or Lichtenauer uh, feather and the Mayer feather. There'll be a difference in proportions, but also in, in uh, technology used. And what Alex told me is they've used different type of steel, uh, kind of advanced type of heat treatment, and also a cross-section of blade you might recognize from the Eastern Sabre, a hollow uh, fullered blade, uh, that we're gonna see on this Mayer feather. So first up, as I've just been talking about it, let's look at the Mayer, Mayer feather. I'm using a Lanxi, because uh, it's quite sharp uh, blade, um, to uh, open this up today. So obviously trying to be careful not to damage anything underneath. Uh, they came very well wrapped in a box um, and came to me, I think, straight from Georgia. Yeah, from Georgia, where uh, Kvetan's manufacturing is now based. Um, so Kvetan's headquarters, uh, you might know, of course, that they were uh, originally a Russian company, but obviously history has moved on. Uh, so the main manufacturing is now in Georgia and the headquarters is now in Czech Republic in Prague. Um, so this, these came to me directly from Georgia and, oh, there we go. Um, the trick with these is always finding the, uh, the end. And if I talk very softly, then maybe we can turn this into an ASMR video. A bit of feedback, guys. Do you like it when I talk more softly? I realize on my videos, I have a tendency to shout. And that's because in the early days when I started making videos, I had a microphone that uh, required me to shout in order for you to be able to hear what I was saying. And I've never really changed from that. And sometimes when I'm editing my videos, I think, mm, I've got much better microphones now and I've got a better space for picking up my audio. Maybe I should speak more softly. <laughs> anyway, that was probably super weird, uh, but it filled some of the time while I undid this wrapping. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe I should talk more softly now in my videos. I kept constantly thinking that after I filmed a video. Um, but I realized that I don't need to shout like I used to because I'm not lecturing to all the people. I think part of the problem is I teach classes every week and um, in big halls and um, I'm used to having to talk really loudly. This looks beautiful. God, that, that cord wrap is really, really nice. So one of my minor criticisms of Kvetan over the years has been that I haven't been a big fan of their grip wraps. Um, and I think, they've, you know, one of the amazing things about Kvetan is they, whenever they ask people, and I've noticed someone else reviewing some Kvetan stuff recently in Finland, um, they always ask people to be completely candid and completely honest. They don't want people to just like sing the praises of their product. Um, even me, even though I'm working with them and I'm developing products um, some of the time and I have done in the past, they want honest reviews um, because that's how they see that they improve. So, you know, kudos to them for that. And I have always been slightly critical of their grip wraps, even on the Eastern Sabre. Full disclosure, I don't think it's the best grip wrap in the world, can be improved. Um, and so yeah, cord wrap, love it. Much prefer a cord wrapped grip than the leather wrapped grip. So it is covered in grease, <laughs> uh, which is as you want. You'd rather have it covered in grease than covered in rust. Look at that, that is beautiful. Oh my gosh. Now it so sounds like I am seeing the prices. Ah, right, okay, that's quite a small tip and I'll talk about that in a second. So here we've got uh, Kvetan's uh, Maker's Mark just down there, covered in grease. So if you're wondering about why the, the blade looks like it's got a weird texture, it's just grease, um, like axle grease type stuff. Uh, but it stops it rusting in, in storage and shipping. So quite a simple um, scent stopper pear shaped pommel. Um, quite nice and smooth, round. It's got no sort of, uh, you know, directional to it. The cross guard is absolutely beautiful. Look at the detailing there on that center escutcheon if we can call it that and that is a very that's this is the mayor there's my light fitting this is the mayor um feather shirt and this type of central escutcheon on cross guards on medieval swords well re me late medieval swords really only comes in later in the 15th century we do start to see them about the middle of the 15th century but they become popular really in the 1470s 80s onwards and they're very, very common on 16th century swords. So it absolutely fits uh, that this should be on the Mayer sword, which is a 16th century fetish vet. And you can see it's got the fullered blade, 
and the uh, Schilt, uh, that all Feder are famous for. If it didn't have a Schilt, we probably wouldn't call it Feder. Um, and also, it's worth mentioning, the escutcheon's very nice and rounded. So, for those of you doing a Zwerch or, um, you know, crump power or anything like that, and putting your thumb up on the blade, there's no issues whatsoever. In fact, the other added detail is having this fuller coming all the way down through the Schilt actually means it's actually like a really nice thumb playset. It's a bit like the World War II V42 um, Raider Knife uh, Commando Dagger. Um, so it actually, accidentally, I think, forms a really nice thumb placer for the thumb there that keeps it nice and secure and helps prevent it sliding off in either direction. So great, <laughs> great accidental idea. Maybe it was deliberate. I don't know. I have to ask um, Alex. And um, We've got these very pretty little terminals they'd be referred to at the end of the quillons. Not quillions, okay? So many people say quillion. It's quillon from the French quillon, uh, which means one of these. So it's a quillon and another quillon together, and they make the cross guard or the guard. Um, and yeah, so it's got good distal tape. But I'll have a look at the flex and the rest of the blade in a second, just focusing on the hilt. It's a relatively long hilt, not massively long, but relative, I would say it's about normal feather length. I think the Lichtenau is shorter. In fact, I know the Lichtenau is a bit shorter than that. Very, very nice. And the fitment, let's lift my glasses up because I'm an old man. Um, yeah, I mean, the fitment, I don't know if you'll be able to see this on camera. The fitment between the guard and the blade is very, very tight. It slightly sits on top of the guard either side here, but it sits down, the tang curves down into the slot of the guard, and it's incredibly tight. I mean, that's as tight, that's as tight as an Albion. It's a super, super tight fit, fitment. So the hilt's lovely. There's one minor thing. There is a little bit, so I was singing the praises of this cord wrap, but there is a little bit of a knot there is a knot and a bit of a lump here. Um, so, you know, again, I'm being completely honest and frank here, that's a bit of a knot that might catch on things and might lift in time. So for some reason, it's completely smooth above and below, but it looks like, and there's a little bit on the other side as well, it looks like something's gone wrong slightly there and there's a slight, I don't know if you'll be able to, yeah, you can probably just see in the, can you see there? It's a slightly raised ridge. Uh, so not sure why that is. In gloves, I mean, probably it wouldn't bother me, but I know I'm mentioning it because I know it will bother some people. So, um, so there we go. Um, overall, though, I much prefer the cord wrapped grip to the leather grips. Uh, the cross guard's beautifully done, the pommel's beautifully done, obviously peened at the end. Uh, you can very much see it's hammered. It's not the tidiest or smoothest hammering in the world, but there's no roughness, there's no lip. Um, maybe that could be polished a bit smoother. Right, now, onto the blade. So, I'll tell you what, I'll grab a, um, grab my measuring tape. So, let's go to the tip to hilt is, wow, it's quite long, 39 and a half inches. It's one meter exactly. So, if we use Imperial here, because I suspect they used Imperial to make it, uh, one meter exactly. Um, is that correct? No, that doesn't seem right. One meter wouldn't be as much as that. Maybe I misread that wrong. Oh, no, one meter exactly. There we go. Thirteen, nearly thirty-nine and a half inches. One meter exactly. Um, so pretty, pretty long blade. Um, if I stand up and go off camera for a second, it's up to my sternum, pretty much. Okay, the pommel comes up to my sternum. Now, in terms of flex, wow, that's really cool. Oh my god. So. I guess a combination of the distal taper and the fact that it's got this fuller all the way down to there, it, it finishes like one inch below the tip, means that when you flex this blade, it literally only, I mean, I guess there must be some microscopic amount of flex here, but it appears to be completely rigid for the first half of the blade and really only flexes in the last third and only a tiny bit in the last, in this third. So basically, first third, no flex. Second third, almost no visible flex. Third third, a little bit of flex. Last third, most of the flex. That does mean it will be putting more stress on the blade up here. We'll have to see how the durability is on these. As mentioned, they've used new high-tech steel and heat treatment. Um, you can ask Kvetan about that. I don't know the full details. Um, but it looks really nice. Very nicely rounded edges. Now, let's talk about this tip. As you guys know, I'm a fan of rolled tips. 
Some people hate roll tips. Some people love flared tips. There are different opinions. <laughs> We're not going to go any more deeply into it than that. I personally prefer roll tips because they have a larger surface area and are hollow and therefore light and they don't make a blade floppy. What they've done here is they've made a flared tip, solid flared tip, but that is pretty damn small. Now, I think that most clubs will require you to put a tip on that, um, rubber or leather or whatever else. That's a pretty small tip for such a, you know, for a longsword, basically, for a weapon that's going to hit with quite a lot of punch. It does mean, in handling, it's fantastic because it's quite light at the tip. Um, and it's, I mean, I'll do more videos when we get to use these uh, and you'll see more handling how they actually function and use. It feels very, very nimble at the tip, but that is, that is really, really small. And I've got to say that for safety in, in, in thrusting, um, if it's hitting you in the chest and the ribs and place and the crotch and places like this, I personally would probably want a tip on a longsword with a with a, you know tip covering on a longsword which has got a tip that small and that relatively thin. So there you go, there's the first look of the Maya. I absolutely love it. I think it's beautifully made. Uh, I love the way it handles so far, obviously in the confined spaces of my study because this is just a first opening, first look video. Handled absolutely beautifully. Really, like maybe one of the nicest handling feathers I've ever held. Right. Let's have a look at the Lichtenauer version now. So, same wrapping, same story as before. Um, now, let's see, with the sound of the cardboard and the, the tape rustling, maybe we can get some ASMR in here. Um, very well wrapped. So we've got the basic sword is wrapped in plastic. It's sheathed in plastic. And then we've got cardboard nestled against it on the outside there and then bound down with tape. <laughs> I think I might have found a new uh, new career here. I don't know. Comments below. Have I found a new career? Um, let's see how many new endos we can squeeze into this video. Right, there we go. So we've got the main. Let's try and find the end of this plastic. This is a bit like when you go on holiday and you've got a uh, Certain types of luggage they like to wrap in plastic, don't they? And it's the same. I think that's probably where the idea came from. Because um, I don't remember swords being wrapped like this until about maybe 10 years ago. Anyway, uh, oh, that's a nice looking cross guard. I like the little swell, swollen knobs. I love a swollen knob. Right. Um, unwrap the grip. Ooh, it's ribbed. It's ribbed, sir. That. It ribbed at the top and the bottom. That's an interesting detail. We'll look at that in a second. Same kind of pommel, actually. It looks like it might even be the exact same pommel as the Maya. And it's got the same type of cord wrapped grip, although in a different style. We'll look at that in a second. And here's the blade. So you can instantly see, hopefully, that Schilt is a completely different shape. And it is a Schilt looks like, uh, is it Von Danzig, I think? Um, yeah, so there we go. Wow, that is surprisingly different handling actually. So this extra mass in the shilt or broad ricasso here is quite a lot. And um, I obviously haven't weighed these swords yet because I've only just unwrapped them, but it feels heavier. It feels more like, whoop, there goes my light fitting in. It feels more like a real sword, if you see what I mean. So the Maya feels more like a fencing feather, and this feels more like a, more like a sharp, I guess. If you imagine, uh, if we talk about Albion swords for a second, if you think about something like the Albion uh, Principe, or um, the Duke, or the, uh, yeah, one of the sort of larger, broader long swords, it kind of feels like that. And that's probably the point, I guess, uh, because it feels more like a real 15th century longsword. Um, now the guard, that is a really good looking guard. It's super simple, but there's something about the proportions and the shape of it that just really, really work. And it's fitted beautifully, like perfectly, between the blade and the guard. I have zero criticism of that at all. It's absolutely perfect. And of course, rings like a bell. The pommel is the same kind of, uh, whatever you want to call it, teardrop, scent stopper. Not really a scent stopper, it's more like a teardrop or a pear-shaped pommel. 
uh, peened pretty much exactly the same as the other one there's no real roughness it could perhaps be polished a bit smoother the grip so the cord wrap on this one looks more tidy than the Maya, i have to say so it doesn't have any knot or lump in it like the other one did and it's got these weird fairly weird ridges here and here at top and bottom of the grip um that's quite curious i wonder if that was a special request from someone because i've never seen they're not quite risers because risers are normally right at the top and bottom of the grip but funnily enough it does give a really good friction grip point for the thumb and index finger where i'd grip it and probably for about my middle or my ring finger down at the pommel end so for the way that i grip the sword it actually provides a really good extra friction and control point and obviously that's a massive shilt so no problem sticking your thumb up there it doesn't have the uh, groove or fuller that the other one does uh, but it's a huge surface i can't imagine your thumb easily coming off that uh, unless it comes off your body which you don't want um, so yeah it's good looking and i like the way that the these lines go up from the blade here so it's like the blade continues down and then it's got these sort of wings at the side which does look a bit like what we see in the um in the uh, treaties image of them and uh, Cavetan's logo on again it's covered in grease so it's a bit difficult to see but it's just there um yeah i love it this is a chunkier longsword let's just have a look at the flex okay so this i don't know whether it's just these particular examples or whether it's the difference between the models this one flexes more evenly through the second half so although it is stiff in the first half i would say this flexes more throughout the second half of the blade and you can even in the middle of the blade you can see some degree of flex so it's completely rigid for the first third then it's got a bit of flex then a bit more flex then more flex but overall the second half of the blade flexes more through its entirety of the second half than the Maya did the Maya it was very much focused up in the last third I don't know whether that's an artifact of the type of distal taper or the fuller that the Maya has that this lip to now doesn't I don't know but that this one is I would say softer in the thrust which is funny because i would have expected the opposite i would have expected overall the maya to be stiffer in the thrust let's just put these on the ground and compare them mm, yeah yeah the maya is stiffer in the thrust so the maya is stiffer in the thrust than the lichter now um they're but neither of them are floppy or anything like that and I, not, this isn't a criticism it's just a point of interest this this has a more even and gentle curve through the second half of the blade the maya is more focused in the last third of the blade now the tip seems to me let's get the maya to be exactly the same on both i've got so much grease on my hands now actually the lichtenau is very slightly bigger so the lichtenau is a slightly broader blade so although they're the same thickness and the same shape and they're both flared tips this one you'll see is very slightly wider just grab the measuring tape I'll tell you in centimeters so that's like 1.8 centimeters wide and this one's only one so it's only quite a big difference so one centimeter wide 1.8 centimeter wide that means that when you're thrusting people this has a relatively in percentage terms a lot more surface area than this one does I, I think that a lot of people are going to find these tips particularly with long swords because that you know long swords often with a two-handed thrust will deliver a lot more force into the target than something like a rapier or a saber but hold on I've got a news flash for you um, for anybody who doesn't like those tips and you might like love those tips there's actually a choice of tips so I've just checked I've just made sure I wasn't sure while I was making the video I've just checked on the uh, Covetan website and absolutely you've got a choice of three different types of tips um, including roll tips so if you want those with a roll tip you can get them with a roll tip the fact is that if you want a roll tip or a different type of tip you can get it with Covetan um, with either of those swords and also I noticed the cord wrap grips which I do prefer if you prefer the leather wrap grip you can also get that as an option as well anyway uh, thank you very much to Cavetan for sending these the the mayor and the Lixen hour uh, which one do I prefer <laughs> that's difficult um, oh I don't know I like them both for different reasons um, for artistry I prefer the the mayor the, I love that cross guard on the mayor for 15th century badassery and just generally looking more like a medieval sword I prefer the Lixen hour for handling it's kind of difficult for fact i kind of know that if i had to compete in a longsword tournament i'd pick the maya because it feels more nimble 
uh, and it feels like most of the blade is relatively slightly stiffer because it only flexes near the tip so I think in the bind it might have a slight advantage and it's like I said it's more nimble so you can disengage and move more easily more quickly with the Maya. I feel like this is a more sluggish sword so I think that it depends what your goal is. If you want something that handles like your sharp cutting longsword of the 15th century style probably the Lichter now is going to be bang on for you. If you want something for competition edge and should we say being a little bit quicker being maybe a little bit relatively stiffer for the weight maybe the mayor um, for looks well everyone's everyone's opinions are going to vary aren't they um, I prefer the look of the shield I have to say on the Lichtenauer I've never been a big fan of the classic um, Feder style shield on like as seen on the Maya here, I actually really quite like this big broad blocky type. It makes it look a bit less like a feather somehow to me. Um, anyway, there we go. Uh, make of that what you will. I'll post some links below to more information. And um, I hope you've enjoyed seeing this first look review. In due course, we will put these through their paces with people using them for fencing in my clubs. Um, and we'll give some feedback both from me and from other people as well. Thanks a lot for watching and yeah, check out the links below. Thanks to Kvetan again for sending these through to me and I'll see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.